is um, what we're going to talk about today, which is energy metabolism and how it relates to sensory processing disorder, is something that is surprisingly very common in kids who have sensory process processing issues. And it's something that I think is not really talked about and not um, it, it doesn't have a lot of, of awareness around it. Um, but before we start, let me just do a quick intro. Um, so I'm for people who are tuning in for the first time, um, I'm Cameron Climo. I have a website called Sensory Mom. And I my mission is to spread awareness about sensory processing disorder and to really just give parents support and education um, to help them navigate parenting a child who has sensory processing issues. And this was born out of my parenting experience mm. with my two boys and, um, and also a result of my professional background in education and psychology. So it's kind of a mixture of all of that. And we were so fortunate to meet you, Dr. K, when Hunter was um, just about to turn one year old. And um, you put us on a totally different trajectory in terms of his development. Um, and, you know, just something that we could not possibly be more <laughs> thankful no. for. And um, so for viewers that don't know you, you are an integrated pediatrician. So you're a, you're a Western trained doctor, but you went on to have all this additional training in all sorts of different modalities to really give you a very unique perspective on children and um their bodies and how the mind and body is all connected and ultimately how to help kids who, um, and this might not be the most fair thing to say, but what I was going to say is help kids um, heal who, you know, what traditional Western medicine has kind of failed. Um, would that be a fair, <laughs> was yeah. that, is that a fair introduction? You know, I, I would say like this. Um, yeah. First of all, thank you for having me. And thank you for hosting this conversation because I yes. think it's so absolutely necessary. And, uh, you, you know, for, for those that don't know, I, I was one of the sensory kids that I take care of. And I yeah. have a daughter who, if she was out of balance, would become a full-blown sensory processing kid. He, uh -huh. She has a lot of sensory sensitivities, but we're constantly nudging her into a state of balance. So uh, for me, this is also a personal discussion because mm -hmm. it's not just of the kids that I take care of. And I was honored right. to have Hunter as one of the kids, yeah. but it's also a discussion for me because I see myself and all the kids that I take mm. care of. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think Western medicine has failed. I think Western medicine doesn't have the tools to even understand what these kids go through right. so much as what to do for them. And, you know, that, that was one of the things that I learned early on in my training. You know, Western medicine, if heavens forbid someone has a catastrophic heart condition or infection, mm -hmm. awesome. You know, Western medicine can save their lives. But when it comes to the more obscure things, and I think sensory yeah. processing disorder is definitely in that world of obscurity, we just, uh, Western medicine doesn't have the ability to really uh, process what this condition is. Right. You know, we give these kids uh, labels of anxiety disorder, ADHD, autism disorder, whatever. Those labels don't tell us what is actually happening inside these kids. Right. And, you know, right. to be really honest with you, I, I think even some of the holistic modalities by themselves yeah. still lack that comprehensive picture. And, you know, I can say this because over the last decade and a half, I've just trained in probably eight or 10 different modalities. Mm -hmm. And that was just because I, I learned one system and I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. And then I was right. like, oh, but it's missing something. Yeah. You know? yeah. So it, it, we have to build a holistic picture. And I'm so grateful that we're having this discussion because uh, for me, one of the things that I've learned over time and trial and error and in working with little ones like Hunter mm -hmm. is that energy metabolism is foundational. It, it's literally like the foundation of the house that then gets built on it. Right. And that, right. that is one of the fundamental things that, that is off and most of the kids have problems with. Right. And when you, in treating these kids and looking at these, you know, our, our bodies and, you know, our children's development is so complex and there's not just one thing 
or one modality that has all the answers. And it takes, um, it takes some dedication and a willingness to um, be open to all sorts of different modalities to kind of put this puzzle all together. And, um, and so I love that, you know, essentially that is what you've spent these last 15 years doing, studying all these different modalities so that you can get a more accurate whole picture rather than just focusing on, you know, a few symptomatic behaviors or this yeah. symptom or that sy symptom. And the other thing that I think is so important, and I see a lot of parents spinning their wheels, and I was one of these parents, is that, you know, you can get your child all the interventions in the world, but if you're not, if you're, if you're missing some of these core underlying issues like problems in energy metabolism, you're not going to get very far. You can have all the top experts, you know, out there in occupational therapy or vision therapy or whatever the, um, the intervention you're trying, but until you get to that like root um, issue, the, the progress is going to be limited. Yeah. Um, and, so, you know, uh, I, I wrote this piece uh, not too long ago. And what, one of the things I put in there is, you know, if you have a car and the engine block itself is uh, faulty, you can change the tires, you can put air in the tires, you can mm -hmm. fix the transmission, the engine is still broken. Right. And for me, energy metabolism is literally the core part of our engine. And mm -hmm. you can't fix the tires, nor should you really focus on the tires until the engine itself is working. And that's a way to yeah. contextualize uh, this discussion that, you know, we, we want the entire car working well. So it's not mm -hmm. that we should ignore the tires or the transmission, but at the same time, what good are nice tires if your engine doesn't work? Right. If you can't start the car. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. So for people like me who, you know, are, are um, need things really spelled out in, in layman's terms, what exactly is energy metabolism? So, I mean, you could get really complicated, but it boils down to we, we stick food in our mouth, right? And somehow that food ultimately gets broken down into nutrients that our body needs to build itself, yeah. right? And energy that gives us life. Like, without energy, we die. I mean, it, it's a really mm -hmm. harsh statement. But, uh, you know, back when I was in my training, sadly, there are a very small percentage of kids that are born with these genetic defects and they can't produce energy yeah. and these these kids go on to pass away which is horrible yeah. in medicine we think that unless a child has that kind of a catastrophic error mm. in their ability mm -hmm. to produce energy they're normal right, and right. what i've realized over the last you know five to ten years of working with kids with sensory processing and my daughter is is the actually perfect example of that mm -hmm. is that what we think is normal is not entirely normal. And there's actually a pretty wide spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, the, there are the super athletes. I mean, you look at like LeBron James, like what he does is weird, right? right. He can like fly through human. the air yeah. and he, he does these physical feats that like most ordinary human beings are just like, what did he do? Like, how right. did he do that? You know, I can't do that. Right. Uh, even if I practice 15 hours a day, I would never be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're the th super athletes that are just physically so competent that it's, it's almost weird. Right. And I think that that is a reflection of how efficient their bodies are in producing energy and movement and movement comes through energy, right? right. Our muscles need energy to contract, to move. Right. And the, the, the more efficient our energy production is, the, the more efficient muscle movement in everything else becomes. Right. And then on the other end of the spectrum are sadly the kids that pass away because they can't produce energy at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because they can't produce this thing called ATP, which is basically electricity, so uh -huh. our bodies take food, break it down, ultimately turn it into electricity. And then that electricity is what runs our body. Gotcha. And then there are kids in the middle, like myself, mm -hmm. my daughter, and probably about 60% of the kids that have sensory processing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this thing that we say, oh, your kid has low tone. 
Yes. Yeah. Or your kid or, or, you know, one of the questions that I love to ask is, so what is your child's endurance like? Mm -hmm. Can they run for 20 minutes nonstop? Can they climb up and down the playground? Right. You know, if they were playing soccer, can they run, 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 run? Or, you know, as some of the families tell me, like if their kids are in soccer, they're like, yeah, she runs for three minutes and then she stops. Yeah. She just stops in the middle of the soccer right. field. Right. You know? like that, that was it. That was, <laughs> and, and that is totally Hunter. Um, he, he, he has a certain amount of energy and it, he's, you know, it, it, from the look of it, if, if you were to watch him running around, you're like, oh yeah, he's super athletic. Then you turn your head and you look back and you're like, oh, like suddenly all the kids are on the other end of the field and there's Hunter back by the goal, like picking grass, like he's done, you know? <laughs> and you're like, wait, what just happened? You know, two minutes ago he was with the pack, but it's, yeah, his, his energy, um, it, the, the endurance just isn't there. So yeah, we know that firsthand. So that is, that's one of the questions. Yeah. yeah like for, yeah. for children who have bursts of energy, but then it sort of fizzles out pretty quickly. Yeah. And a, a lot of times with this, uh, their muscle tone is low. So like monkey mm -hmm. bars, actually, you know, the kids that can hang on, hang on the monkey bars for 15 minutes, like little yeah. monkeys yeah. versus, you know, the other kids, my daughter and myself being included, right. you know, where we can hang for 30 seconds and we're like, oh God, okay. That was I'm exhausting. Done. Yeah. Was exhausting. Yeah. Yeah. And we think that kids are acting lazy, Right. So right. when the kid doesn't run, oh. we're like, why are you being so lazy? Yes. You're not being lazy. And we're getting mad and we're judging yeah. them. Yeah. 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 This yeah. is not, uh, they, they don't want to be this way. Right. You know, Hunter doesn't want to not chase the ball. It's right. literally that his body taps out. And while every other kid still has the electricity, you know, yeah. their batteries are yeah. still charged. Hunter's batteries ran out. So he stopped. Right. So, so. When the energy metal, when you say it, it um, the electricity part, can you explain mm -hmm. that a little bit more? Because yeah. it's confusing so, to me. So, AT, so basically, we, we have three food types, right? Fat, mm -hmm. carbohydrates, and protein. And ultimately, our body needs to take this and basically break it down to the basic uh, pieces. Right. Carbohydrates basically get broken down into sugar. Mm -hmm. Fats get broken down to fatty acids, which are the uh -huh. building blocks. And then protein gets built, broken down into amino acids. Amino acids. Uh -huh. Now, these become fuel. So they be become building blocks too. So amino acids go on to build muscle, but we can also okay. turn protein into energy. And energy is basically ATP. So there's a bunch of different biochemical processes that take place. And mm -hmm. I think the details of that aren't important. But ultimately, protein, fat, and carbohydrates get broken down and get converted to electricity. So we have these little generators. So if you can just imagine a generator, you pour gasoline in it, right? And then you stick a cord on the other side and boom, electricity comes out and then you use that electricity to power stuff. Uh -huh. Or in the case of our cars, we have these uh, converters or inverters where they take the power of the engine and ultimately give electricity to the car. So our radios work, our headlights work and so forth. Right. Right. A similar thing happens inside the body. Ultimately, the body takes food and mm -hmm. turns it into ATP, which is basically our electricity currency in the body. Right. And electri th that electricity, if we want to say, is what powers everything in our body. It powers our movement. It powers our brain. It powers our liver. It powers our organs. Right. Literally every single part of our body is dependent on this energy to function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when that energy is low, and I speculate that you know, guys like Hunter, ladies like my daughter, people mm -hmm. like myself are somewhere between probably 30 to 40% less efficient in our ability uh. to produce electricity from the food we take in. So we still right. take in the same amount of food. Right. It's not that Hunter isn't eating as much food. Right. It's just how much of that food gets converted, converted. into electricity efficiently for the body to then use to do all of the stuff that it does. And is this might be a, a, a tangential question, but um, is part of the reason why for some people that becomes less efficient? Does it have to do with um, gut, like your the 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 state of the your microbiome and your um, the quality of of the bacteria in your gut? Like if you have gut dysbiosis, is that a factor in energy production or are those two separate? 
So it's indirectly related. So the gut okay. bacteria, the efficiency of our gut ultimately impacts how much of the nutrients that we eat we can, can, we can absorb. So okay. they can impact the absorption of the food. So the quality of what we take into our body from our gut. Right. Ultimately, there are enzymes, these little proteins that take those food building blocks and then convert it into one thing and then another and then another. And then 30 processes later, you have electricity. Gotcha. I think to some extent, that process is dictated by genetics. Okay. Because perfect example, you know, while my daughter has more my feet, my constitution mm -hmm. and is lowered energy, our five month old is absurdly strong. Like right. his degree of energy production is ridiculous. You right. know, and right. he, he has so much energy. It is, it's weird. Yeah. Uh, so he's on the opposite end. Yeah. Of things. Yeah. I also think and believe that, you know, certain toxins, uh, for instance, glyphosates, which they use as pesticides and herbicides on uh -huh. plants, actually have been found to be what we call metabolic disruptors. So okay. they actually go in there and muck up these proteins that mm -hmm. then don't allow the conversions to take place as efficiently, which it almost it's like sludge in your engine. If you can imagine yeah. sludge just kind of grinding everything down and the engine just doesn't work as fast. Right. Glyphosates right. and certain toxins and compounds are like sludge mm -hmm. and it just makes everything go slower and everything just doesn't work as well. And that, right. that is where we think to some extent outside of our genetics, energy production gets mucked up yes. and really doesn't work as well. Okay, that's interesting. It's, I, I, you know, I'm always curious um, about the why, like why does this happen or what caused this? Although, you know, it, it's not always so important to understand that, but, but I think for, for parents tuning in, just understanding that this is a big part of the picture for a lot of kids that um, that the kids who are um, like you said um, sluggish or um, not able to have sustained endurance when they're on the playground the kids who kind of prefer to sit quietly and play versus run and climb and jump which is what kids are you know naturally inclined to do um, that oftentimes in those kids that is that the energy metabolism is one of the the core foundational issues that's interfering with their ability to move and their mm -hmm. um their ability really to just engage in life yeah. and what often accompanies that um are a lot of behavioral issues um and so when you don't understand what's going on as a parent, you just think, why is my child being so difficult? You know, and, yeah. and back to the judgments, you're like, oh, all the other kids are following the soccer ball. Mine's over there picking flowers. What the heck's wrong with them? You know, and you're going, come on, Hunter. I mean, there's, I mean, I understand, but even, even for me, sometimes I'm like, Hunter, Hunter, get with the other kids. You know, you just, um, it can be really hard not to have yeah. those yeah. judgments about your child. Um, as far as the energy metabolism and sensory processing, what is the link between those two? Well, I, I think to start at a very simplistic level, um, and you know, one of the things we, we had touched on before is how a lot of guys like Hunter, uh, they don't do well when they don't sleep, right? Mm -hmm. Lack of sleep is one of their big triggers. Yeah. And if they haven't had, and you know, and it, it's interesting as a pediatrician who sees a lot of kids, to see a whole spectrum where some kids, you know, young kids, three-year-olds, five-year-olds, they get 10 hours of sleep and they're great. And yeah. then if other kids don't get like 13 hours of sleep and they may be six or eight years of age, yeah. uh, they fall apart. Yes. So that goes into the discussion of basically how resilient and strong is the body. Mm -hmm. And when you look at strength and resiliency, ultimately that has to do with energy. Um, the way to look at this is, well, here's the way to contextualize it. Imagine feeling like you had the flu. Remember that icky kind of sluggish, you just don't feel good. You yeah. just, you run down. Remember? So for, for some of these kids, I actually think that they have some mild version of the flu all the time. Mm -hmm. If you can imagine what kind of a hellish experience that's like, right. where you're just always run down, you're just always tired and 
when you're tired and run down, you're just automatically extra crabby, right? Yeah. Everything gets under your skin. Everything bothers right. you because you just don't feel well. Right. And you're not motivated to do anything. No. Like, you know, when I'm just thinking from a movement perspective, even starting in, um, you know, when I think back at um, Hunter's infancy, I mean, the, his um, reluctancy to move his body was evident when he was just a few months old. And I had no idea. I'd never even heard of energy metabolism, nor, you know, let alone Most like haven't. knew what it was. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you can see, or in hindsight for me, I can look back and now I understand, oh my gosh, it, he, he just, he lacked the energy to actually do those movements. And, um, and as an infant, it was, um, you know, there were other pieces to the puzzle too, um, trouble with bilateral coordination and, um, and, and, um, like crossing midline and stuff like that, that made things harder for him, but just grabbing his toes and pulling his toes up to his mouth. Like most babies do that automatically. He couldn't mm -hmm. do that. You know, yeah. he couldn't roll side to side. He couldn't yeah. stay on tummy time. Yeah. Um, and very early on, we had a physical therapist say right like within 15 minutes of evaluating him your son has low tone well of course I had no idea what that meant um most people now, don't <laughs> yeah exactly and so now in this context it it all makes sense it's um his body was inefficient in his energy production which then led to um an inability to move his body in a typical way that you would expect yeah. um, for a baby's development. And so then there were delayed milestones and all of these developmental things are building blocks. So when they're slightly delayed or they're missed, it impacts the next stage of development mm -hmm. and it all starts to kind of build on itself. Yep. Um, so, and Look at, so we, we talked about just feeling icky. And I mm -hmm. think for the older kids who are just quick to get upset, quick to get mad, there's just that generalized icky feeling. Yeah. Now, what you touched on is brilliant. And I'm so glad that you brought that up. Uh, so what is one of the most energy dependent systems in our body? Our muscles, right? Mm -hmm. Our muscles are heavily dependent on energy to do the contractions, you know, to do the right. movements and rolling, crawling, tummy time, walking, all of these things are actually really hard muscular feats right. to, for a kid to do, especially if you don't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. And you know, for a lot of kids, what we presume is just, oh, every kid crawls or every kid rolls over. It's actually really hard. Yeah. And yeah. if your muscles are too weak, so you want to do it, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like trying to lift 50 pound dumbbells. You know, everyone wants to be able to be, be that strong. Mm -hmm. That's really heavy weight. Yeah. And not everyone can, can curl or lift a 50 pound dumbbell. Right. For some kids trying to roll over, trying to crawl, trying to... Mm -hmm walk. Those are really hard tasks when your muscles are too weak, your right. tone is too low to be able to do that easily. Right, right. And, and the, the part of that that gets really interesting is when you look at what you touched on with the developmental piece. Mm -hmm. So when we roll, when we crawl, when we cross our midline, all of these things are actually critical for neural integration, right? right. That's what o occupational therapists do. Right. They have these kids go through these movements because those movements are needed for parts of the brain to connect to and the neural networks to g gel together Mm -hmm. to allow us to actually process if it enter, uh, information from our world efficiently right right sense of our world right and what was surprising to me that I had never learned um, in my professional training was how important movement is for brain development how early movement is the foundation for brain development upon which all higher level learning is built and so even, you know, the, and when you were talking earlier about how there's like kind of this broad range of things um, and how what we consider normal is like this really broad range in the, in like kind of the traditional Western sense of normal. So they'll say, oh, well, 
you know, he didn't roll over till he was six months, but you know, it's still within the range of normal. Well, that wasn't really normal actually for, for Hunter, for, you know, a baby. I mean, um, you know, oh, well, he didn't crawl till he was almost 10 months, but you know, he still crawled and he walked it. It was all fine, but it actually wasn't. It, it's much more yeah. nuanced, I think, um, than we're, we're uh, led to believe. And unless, it, 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 my experience has been, unless there is like a, a very overt um, delay, that it kind of just gets sort of put into this range of, well, they'll be fine, you know, where ultimately, you know what, they will be fine. But they're probably going to, kids who have those issues like Hunter, is he fine? Yeah, he's doing okay. We've done a lot of intervention for him, but he's struggled, you know, and, um, and, and I, I know, you know, we've talked about this a lot, that it's just kids do not have to struggle this much. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that has helped Hunter the most and has been the most transformative piece for him has been addressing this very issue of energy mm. metabolism to get this poor little kid to get his system running more efficiently so he can actually be himself, yeah. you know, and, um, I, I, one of the things I, I wanted to um, really highlight for parents are what are some of the signs that your child has poor energy metabolism? So we kind of touched on like the endurance, like not having a lot of endurance, but what are um, some of the other like red flags that you look for when you're... So, you know, I, I think that the most apparent and obvious uh, sign is really a child's endurance or the child that, you know, exerts themselves and crashes, mm -hmm. uh, how good their muscle tone is. So mm -hmm. monkey bars, hanging on monkey bars, uh, trying to repeatedly, you know, lift heavier things. Mm -hmm. These are all uh, the most obvious signs of if there's yeah. an energy issue or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there, there are other subtle things like the kids that, for instance, develop dark circles under their eyes, especially if they haven't slept. Mm -hmm. uh, that's actually a sign of an adrenal gland imbalance. And we can touch on this you know, at, at some point in the future. Yeah. But it turns out that the adrenal glands are also very energy hungry organs. Mm -hmm. So it's just it really, it, it boils down to how robust and resilient is the vitality of your child. Right. And if that vitality is high, if there's a lot of vitality, everything is just running optimally. Right that's probably a sign that there's good energy metabolism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If the wind blows the wrong way and your child's system flops over right, right, and that right. the vitality is lacking, yeah. chances are energy metabolism is low. One of the things, that's a great way to put it. Cause <laughs> I have, you know, I have two boys. So um, my, my younger son, he is totally different, you know, and, and the way that um, it manifests and I, for Hunter too, is that, um, and this has been since he was an infant. Um, I remember actually this asking a girlfriend of mine who um, already had kids when Hunter was a baby. I remember being on the phone so vividly and saying, is it normal for babies to always wake up crying? Mm. Every time Hunter woke up from sleeping when he was an infant, he woke up screaming, mm. crying. And after a while, I'm like, you know, I'm a first time mom. I, I don't know. I'm like, and I just remember my girlfriend going, um, no, you know, and she was like, does, and I go, he never just wakes up and is like cooing. And I go and pick him up. He, I wake up to a screaming baby every, mm -hmm. multiple times a day. And as he grew into his toddlerhood and preschool, when he wakes up in the morning, he is very sluggish and very groggy, even if he got 12 hours of sleep. Um, just um, really slow to get going. Yeah. Where my other son, my younger son, I mean, he could get like eight hours of sleep and he wakes up like the Energizer bunny. <laughs> He's running down the stairs. We hear him pitter patter. It sounds like an elephant, like running across. He's like, mommy. He's just, you know, and Hunter wakes up and he's like grumpy. He's in a bad mood. And he just, it takes him such a longer time to get going. So, you know, to me, that, that's one of the big ways that it manifests 
for him mm -hmm. as well. And then just um, another way is when we're on play dates at the playground, you know, he'll be with a group of friends and every, and he'll be having a great time running around. Well, sure enough, at some point he will come over, sit down and he'll just look at me and go, mommy, I'm so tired. Baby. Yeah. So it, it's like his body just physically runs out of energy. Yeah. And, um, when you identified this in him and we started supplementing him, um, with a couple different things, the difference has been like night and day. I mean, he, it, it's, it's just been remarkable. So I'd love to touch on that as well for, sure. for parents sure. who are like, oh my gosh, this sounds exactly like my child. Um, you know, what can I do? Because, and, yeah. And, you know, th th I think this is part of why I love doing what I do because you could take a child, you know, if this was 30 years ago, and we were just talking in the abstract of like mm -hmm. these things being there. And it's just like, well, sorry, you're, you're kind of out of luck. You know, this is just what is. Right. I think the really cool thing is we actually have tools that can make a huge difference. And I don't know how quickly you saw a change in Hunter, but in a lot of my patients, yeah. I see, you know, sometimes within a week or two, like these mm -hmm. kids just transform mm -hmm. into another human being, which is the yeah. coolest thing in the world yeah. to see. Yeah. No, we saw, I mean, I would say it was... It was probably around like four weeks of being on the protocol that I really noticed just this like emergence of my sweet, happy little mm -hmm. guy, you know, that all of a sudden, and I shared this in, in one of our other conversations, um, that, you know, this is a kid who, he, he never has been an affectionate kid. And um, not, not really verbally, and, and he's never really been like a snuggler. And all of a sudden, he would just come up to me out of nowhere and give me the biggest hugs and go, Mommy, I love you so much. Oh. I mean, to the point where oh. I'm just like in tears. So not only did his energy improve and his mood improves. I mean, you know, he still has his moments. Let's be honest here. I mean, he's, he's not, he still has his moments. But those moments are few and far between where those moments used to not be moments that that was the everyday norm. So in the morning now he wakes up and he comes downstairs and sometimes he's groggy, but most mornings he comes down and he's laughing and he's joking. He runs Aww. over and gives me a hug. I mean, it's completely different. And, um, you know, we go for long bike rides. He, my husband takes him every morning. They go for a four mile bike ride there's no way Hunter would have done that before. I mean, you know, he would have gone a mile or so and been, I'm tired. I'm thirsty. Can we go home? And, you know, just really struggling. And now it's so funny because our younger son is the one who, you know, he's, he's only five and a half. So going four miles is a bit, and Hunter will give him the heart. He's like, Oh, Cruz, it's only four miles, you know? And he's like, I mean, it's so cute, but so yeah, it, I would say for us, it was a, a, about a month. And then, and then it was just so apparent and, and remarkable, the shift. Um, so, oh. and, yeah, you were saying that sometimes it's even happens more quickly. Yeah. In kids. So, sometimes it does. And sometimes yeah. it takes a little while for the system to kind of come online. But right. you know, I think what you touched on, and you know, I love hearing these stories. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what makes it all of this so worthwhile. Because yeah. when you give a child that degree of quality of life and you allow them to thrive you know mm -hmm. it's it, their entire future changes right totally hunters yeah. and their sense of self yes sorry to interrupt yeah because they internalize that like the kids like Hunter who are like you said feeling so like just not good inside their bodies and then their behavior starts to match that and then they're getting judged and and um you know whether it's by their parents or their teacher um and then they're internalizing this sense of like, oh, I'm bad. Something's yeah. wrong with me. And that's yeah. the most heartbreaking yeah. part. And Hunter definitely had begun to internalize that and had said to me on several occasions, like, you know, on the heels of having some big meltdowns and outbursts, he would, he'd say, mom, I'm just a bad kid. And it just would eat me 
a lot, you know, just eat me up. And I'd say, no, honey, no, no, it's okay. You know, we're, your body is just struggling. We're, and we're going to help you and trying to get him to understand that that's not you. It's not who you are. It's that it's something that your body is out of balance and we're going to help your body get back in balance. And Mm -hmm. now he really understands that. And he's able to say to me, um, when he starts to kind of fall apart, because he still does have his moments, he'll stop and he'll go, mom, I'm just tired. Mm-hmm. And I'll say, okay, you know, and then we, we can work with it. Okay, let's lay down. What do you need right now? Um, and, and he can kind of redirect himself. And of course, he's older now. He's almost eight. So this, you know, wasn't the case when he was younger. But, um, but and I know I interrupted say- there. Yeah. Well, would you say even that degree of self-control regulation and awareness was there a few months ago prior to the treatments that no, he had received? No, it, it really has. Well, yes and no. I think, I think it was there, but he could not access it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I get it. And I try to think about this. Um, I think about times when I don't feel good inside my body when my system is really yeah. off. And I think about my level of patience during mm-hmm. those times, which is mm-hmm. non-existent, you know, <laughs> and I go, Oh yeah. my gosh, look at how I behave. And I'm expecting my, um, set, like my, my little guy to, to have all this self-control and no, like, um, and so that has helped me to kind of understand and, and be able to empathize more yeah. with him. But as far as that level of self-control, you know, as he has matured, that has definitely improved. Um, But prior to getting his system in balance, um, I think part of the big frustration for him was that some part of him knew or uh, that he could um, kind of control his behavior, but, but he couldn't. You know, yeah. see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, he, yeah. yeah, it just, it like wasn't available to him. His, his, um, his system kind of overrode that ability. Um, and so with the supplementation that he's been on and, and having more energy, I just think there's so much more that's available to him and mm-hmm. he can really pivot a lot quicker than he was able to in the past. Um, it, 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 the best thing in the world is to hear when little ones like Hunter do well. And especially because yeah. I, I know you guys so well, it makes me even happier to hear that it's happening for you. Yes. And the, it affects the whole family. Yes. I mean, that's, and, and I, I'm, I'm interrupting a lot, but <laughs> one thing that um, is so hard for families is that when, when you have a child like that, who has these issues and has, um, you know, these energy problems that cause them to not be able to self-regulate really is, is the issue that they, they have a much harder time regulating their emotions and um, regulating their bodies um, that they, um, they kind of set the tone for the whole family. And it's really difficult um, to be dealing with that day in and day out. And when I say yeah. that, I'm referring to like the behavioral component that goes along oftentimes with kids who have low energy and are often melting down much more frequently and in ways that are much more intense than parents know how to handle. You know, Mm -hmm. I think you said one time like that when your daughter was, um, when her energy was low, like all of a sudden, you know, the wind would blow or something would happen. And all of a sudden she's having this meltdown and you're like, wait, what just happened? And it's so confusing for parents. And, Mm -hmm. um, and I guess my point with that was that it, it really affect, it affects the siblings. It affects, you know, both parents, it affects the marital relationship. Like it really affects the, the family as a whole. And, um, yeah. and it's just really difficult to deal with. So yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, it's taxing, right? To have a kid that's constantly losing their mind, even if you have all yeah. of the parenting skills. I mean, yeah. even if you're a full-fledged you know, child psychologist, if your kid implodes every two seconds for nothing, yeah. at some point that's just physically, mentally exhausting for the parent, for right. the entire family. You know, the siblings get the brunt of it because yes. ultimately either from lack of attention from the parents yeah. or the sibling gang getting attacked. So right, it, it, right. it's so taxing on so many regards. And, you know, I, I love this story that you share because children ultimately act out whatever it is that they feel. Yeah. And that, that's part of why I actually love working with kids because the, everything is just an open door and whatever is there comes out. If they're feeling well, they act well. Right, right. If they're not feeling well, they don't act well. And yeah. you know, this is part of kind of the premise behind holistic minds and mm. part of what I do, which is if the kid is acting out, if they're having all of these unwanted behaviors that then get whatever label or diagnosis, right. it's because they don't feel well. Right. And this is one of the things that I think is missing from our consciousness, our, our psyche, yeah. our, our awareness as a community that mm-hmm. we don't get that these kids like Hunter like my daughter, like all of these kids that we work with, they just don't feel well. Yeah. They yeah. just don't feel good. Yeah. And how can you expect a kid to behave well? I mean, adults don't yeah. behave well, like exactly. you said. I, I'm, I'm guilty <laughs> right. of that myself. When, right. when I don't take care of myself, I mean, I become one crabby reactive mess. Right, right. And right. everything gets I can't imagine skin. that though, by the way, Dr. K. <laughs> I can't imagine. Talk to my wife. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. No, but it's true. It's true. We, it's... It, it, that is the foundation, like our, our sense of physical well-being, um, how we actually feel physically, and then our emotional well-being is so intricately linked to that. Mm-hmm. Um, that sets the stage for our behavior, whether you're a yeah. two-year-old or a 45-year-old, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that's, it's such a good point. And, you know, I think that to go along with this, we think that what shows up at psychological is entirely mental. Mm-hmm. You know, that thoughts are the only reason why people behave a certain way. And, you know, in working now with hundreds, if not thousands of kids like Hunter, one thing I've realized is that's actually not the case at all. Yeah. That our, yeah. our body, the functioning of our body, the functioning of all of the things in the body, and maybe mm-hmm. what we can do is actually do a follow-up uh, on this talk because I'd love to get into all of the other things that energy impacts because right. it's not just our muscles. It's not just how we feel. Right. I mean, literally every organ system in our body gets affected and we can mm-hmm. get into that just so parents realize that this isn't just, oh, kids start moving a little bit more. It's not just because they, they have a little bit more energy. Literally right. every organ in the body changes. Right. That's that's where I think for parents, if if they don't take away anything from this video, if they just understand that when you don't have enough energy, you just Mm -hmm. don't feel well. When your kid doesn't have enough efficient energy production, Mm -hmm. they just they're they're for lack of a better way, they're in pain. They're they're suffering inside. That they're they're uncomfortable. Right. And they, you know, even adults can't even sometimes articulate like, God, I just don't feel well. Yeah. Forget about the eight year old. They just act out because they don't feel well. They do not feel well. Exactly. And all of this starts to, to build on itself. So you're not feeling well, you're not moving your body as much, then you're, you're not developing skills, gross motor, fine motor skills, emotional regulation skills at kind of the appropriate developmental rate and it all kind of starts to snowball Mm -hmm. and where it really um, oftentimes it kind of comes to a head is once kids reach school and you know that they're you know have all these additional um, stressors placed on Mm -hmm. them with behaving in school, sitting upright, mm-hmm. holding the pencil, having mm-hmm. the energy to, you know, function all day at school, running around on the playground with their friends. They come home from school at the end of the day and they are just a complete disaster, you know, and the, yeah. the, the moms usually kind of get the brunt <laughs> of it of like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And, you know, when you, when you zoom out and you look at the whole picture, 
you know, you can see for, I, I know from the families that I work with as well, you can trace it all the way back and you can see these early signs yeah. that were leading to this. Yeah. And I think one of the most exciting things for me in, in having access to you and your, your incredible base of knowledge is to put these things out there to, to parents that there are some really simple interventions that you can try early on that are super safe, that can potentially make a huge difference in your child. Um, and so, I, I'd say a uh, CoQ10 is probably one of the most important uh, things for parents mm -hmm. to test out. So CoQ10 is one of the cofactors. So it's a vitamin, basically, mm -hmm. that helps uh, the electron transport chain. So that's a fancy term for the generator in the body to work better. So mm -hmm. it's almost like a lubricant, if you want to say, for the generator and it helps the generator that's sluggish start working more efficiently to produce better, more efficient electricity from the energy that's there. Uh -huh. um, depending on the age of the child, uh, and CoQ10, fortunately, is a very safe compound, so you can't yeah. you could technically overdose, but you'd have to give an absurd amount of it. Right. But somewhere between, let's say, 50 milligrams for a three-year-old, upwards of 200 milligrams for a 10 to 12-year-old is a good uh -huh. dose. Uh -huh. The thing with CoQ10 that people have to be very mindful of is the quality of it. Mm. So certain things like magnesium, fish oils, you don't have to be that picky about. CoQ10, right. you have to be really picky about because mm. uh, you could get really poor quality CoQ10, which makes it almost worthless. Right. And then there's very good quality CoQ10, which is generally much more effective. Yeah. A way to know if you're getting a good quality CoQ10 is if you find ubiquinol. So it's ubi Q-U-I-N-O-L. Okay. Uh, ubiquinol is a generally a much higher quality form of CoQ10. It's a little more expensive. It's mm -hmm. a little harder to find. But if you're finding something that has ubiquinol, it's generally a good sign that good you're quality. getting a high quality CoQ10. Okay. Um, there are some combination multivitamins that have CoQ10 in them. Right. Uh, Agape, uh, A-G-A-P-E, mm -hmm. uh, from Awaken Nutrition, I think, is mm -hmm. one of them. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, and I have no affiliations with any of these companies. Right. Um, right. Not all kids love the taste of Agape. Um, my favorite uh, brand is NeuroNeeds, uh -huh. um, and I have no, I don't make a dollar in saying this. Right. Right. Uh, I, I just found that one, kids like the taste of it more than yeah. the other ones. Uh, and the combination of the vitamins that they've put in there is, you know, if I had a magic wand and can create a perfect multivitamin, right. uh, that would actually that would be, be probably as yeah. close to it. Yeah. Uh, but there are several blends. And part of why these blends are helpful is they don't just give the CoQ10. They also give the B vitamins. So mm -hmm. B complex, mm -hmm. if, if families wanted to do it separately, doing a multivitamin that has some methylfolate. Right. Uh, that has some methyl B12, has B1, B2, B3. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those are actually pretty important. Uh, you need right. a little bit of magnesium. Uh, right. You could do this separately. So getting like a decent quality multivitamin that has methylfolate. So uh -huh. and when you look at the, the types of B, the children's multivitamins, if you see methylfolate, that's generally a good sign, meaning that they've sourced the products, right? Because you right. can also get very not good quality uh yeah yeah there's so many on the market <laughs> yeah yeah well i can speak to neuro needs because um or spectrum needs because that's what our boys are taking and i'm actually taking it too so um <laughs> and as far as the taste i have two very very picky boys and they take it no problem i mix it with um a little bit of honest kids juice which um, is like a lower sugar, so it's good and it still tastes good. And um, and they they like it. It has kind of like a lemony lime flavor to it. Of the kids that I find who have energy issues, yeah. the primary issue that they have is they don't effectively take fat and turn it into energy. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the one out of the three parts. So protein, fat, and carbohydrates. Yeah. The fat piece is where their issue is, mm. and carnitine is the shuttle. So it basically takes the the broken down fat, and it it's like the truck that loads up all the fat and then delivers it to the the generator to ultimately right. take that fat and turn it into energy. Carnitine is basically the truck. It's the shuttle that. Mm-hmm does that conversion. And uh, for, for a lot of the kids, in addition to the multivitamins, uh, or if we're doing it separately along with it, I'll do some right. carnitine. And fortunately, carnitine is one of the things that it really doesn't matter. Right. Um, you can go on Amazon, places like iHerb, and yeah. get a cheap old carnitine. It's all the same. It all right. works. And that's we one have of the a- ones- Oh, sorry. We we have um, one from Amazon that's a liquid. Mm-hmm. And it's it, Hunter loves it. He takes it no problem. And, um, and I actually started taking it too. And it's, um, yeah, I think it's like $18. So it's yeah. very reasonably priced. And yeah. 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 So uh, I add a little bit of carnitine in addition, even if they're taking the multivitamin. And the mm-hmm. general dose for carnitine is depending on the size of the kid for like a three to five year old, probably about 500 milligrams. And mm-hmm. if you've got a, you know, 12 year old, you can push up to 2000 plus milligrams uh-huh. of carnitine. And that would be a pretty good dose. And, you know, for all of these things, if you do these supplements within, let's say two to four weeks, not that everything should get better. Yeah. But if you start seeing a change where you're like, whoa, my, my kid is yeah. starting to crawl. My kid is starting to walk faster. My kid is running. Like in the case of what you said with Hunter, whoa, how did he ride his bike four miles? He wasn't willing to ride it at all. Right. You you start seeing this change. And I'd I'd say within a month, you should start seeing something that's noticeable if the issue is there. Yeah. When you, um, when you start with the, the root physical stuff and you're able to balance that out and get the child feeling better, then your child's going to have so much more, um, a, a, a much better ability to make progress in occupational therapy or um, with vision therapy or with physical therapy or whatever the interventions are that you are doing to help your child. They'll just have so much more headspace, you know, for lack of a better Capacity. way of explaining it. Yeah, to, to take those interventions in. Um, and ultimately, when they feel better in their body, they are just naturally going to behave better. And, um, and you know, I have lived this firsthand with Hunter. And the other thing I will say is that, um, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this sometimes, because um, Hunter still has his moments, you know, he, he's an intense kid and, and he feels things intensely and he can still have these meltdowns. Um, and sometimes when it happens, I'm like, oh no, it's like I have this expectation that it was all supposed to like disappear, you know, and that's not realistic. Um, and when, when I step back and I go, oh, wait a minute, those meltdowns used to be happening three to four times a day, every day. Now they're happening maybe once a week, maybe once every other week. I mean, that is a dramatic transformation. So um, I want to just put that out there to parents just to be realistic, you know, about your child's development and your expectations um, around it. And and to understand that there's nothing that's going to, you're you're not going to try one supplement and then, you know, a week later, your your child's morphing into this, you know, (laughs) perfectly behaved child. I mean, if that (laughs) even exists. Um, So, you know, we want to, we want to be real, very realistic about everything. Um, And also we want to understand that there are things that you can do that are pretty simple and that can make a big difference. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I love your crazy to calm journal. Uh, oh, thank you. It, it's yeah. perfect. And it, yeah. you know, I actually recommend that for a lot of families because mm. I think for families to do journaling, even if it's mm. not every day, once a week to go in there and like, okay, how many tantrums do we have? Right. How many right, meltdowns right. do we have? Yeah. You know, and by doing a scale of one to 10 or whatever, however they're journaling, you know, on a weekly yeah. basis or more often kind of track where things are. Mm-hmm. Sometimes when you do that, and then after a few weeks, you're like, whoa, yeah. Oh my God, things have changed. It happens sometimes right underneath your nose, but change happens when you can start tracking it in that way. Right. Right. And, 
you know, I, I think what you touched on with kids having more capacity, mm-hmm. you know, I, I've, I've had kids in my practice where they come to see me after three years of occupational therapy and the kid is just slightly better off than they mm-hmm. were before. And then we really tune up their system. Mm-hmm. And then in three months, the OT is like, oh my God, like how did they make so much progress? Like right. in three months, they do more than what they did in three years. Right. And that goes back to how do you expect a car whose engine is almost about to break down to tow a trailer? You know, mm-hmm. putting a kid in occupational therapy is really hard work. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. these kids have to do work. It's not like they're yeah. sitting there twiddling their thumbs. They're right. doing a lot of hard work. Mm-hmm. And hard work requires a lot of energy. Energy, yeah. And if you don't have energy, you can't do the work. Right, right, right. So by, by increasing energy, by increasing their vitality, by increasing their capacity, mm-hmm. we make all of this easier for the kids to right. do. And all of a sudden, OT, that was this horrible drag for a kid that was a pain for them, suddenly becomes fun. Fun, yeah. And They're they excited actually, to go. yeah. Because yeah. now it's it's fun. It's a game. Yeah. Which is what yeah. it should be. Exactly. And I think life in general, you know, life stops being a drag. Mm-hmm. Life is no longer a pain, which yeah. is kind of how these kids experience life. And mm-hmm. I, I love what you touched on. You know, kids ultimately experience life however they do. And they start forming this image of I'm a bad kid and Mm -hmm. life is hard and everything sucks. And they start internalizing that. But Mm -hmm. when we change these things, energy being one of them, Mm -hmm. all of a sudden their experience of the world, their uh, outlook on the world changes. And when that changes, all of a sudden their self-image their future yeah. self-image yes. starts shifting. Yes. Th- that's the part that, you know, tickles me to death because, mm-hmm. you know, it, it breaks my heart to think what happens to a kid that basically grows up the entire time feeling I'm a bad kid. Yeah. Life yeah. is a drag. Life sucks. Yeah. Everything I'm not is good hard. at anything. I'm not yeah. good. I, and, and I'm bad because they, they start realizing like right. they're the vein of the existence of their family. Right. They're the trouble right. for other people. Yes. And I honestly really get troubled to think like, well, if a kid grows up internalizing that self-image, mm-hmm. what kind of an adult do they yeah. become? Yeah. Oh my gosh. Trust me. <laughs> I have like laid awake many a night <laughs> worrying about that with Hunter, you know, Mm -hmm. and just worrying because knowing that like, oh my gosh, things are harder for him and he knows it. And what is that, you know, going to do to the way he views himself? And I have to say like in these last couple months, as, um, as he has really emerged as his kind of true self and, and, um, and had more energy and just been happier and able to like take part in things and really, you know, go for the four mile bike ride and come back and still have energy. Um, I see like a difference in him and in, mm-hmm. in a difference in the way he is experiencing himself. Even when, you know, we, when we go to the beach and um, it used to be, we go and he'd boogie board for a little while. He loves the water. He's like a little mm-hmm. fish. Um, but then he'd get tired and he would come and, and, and sure, we, there would always be a meltdown. You know, we just expect it. There's always going to hmm. be a meltdown. And, um, you know, you're kind of always waiting on pins and needles, like when's it going to happen? And now in the last couple of months, we've going to the beach. I mean, he come, he'll boogie board come and he's like, oh, I want a snack. Okay. He'll go, okay, come on, mom. We, we got to go back out. Runs back in the water. <laughs> I mean, I can't get him out of the water. He comes home. <laughs> he's, he's, you know, and I see this um, just... The, this different part of him and, and a way that he's experiencing himself differently where he's really getting to, to, to experience who he really is that no, like he is a super athletic kid who, you know, loves to be active where before it didn't seem like that was the case because he, he just simply did not have the energy to do the stuff that he wanted to do. Um, and so even just in these past couple months, um, seeing, and even with the schoolwork, with our, Mm. with our distance learning, you know, um, and just seeing this, um, the more of a willingness to, um, 
to put himself out there with reading and writing and to do things that were a little bit harder for him where before if he didn't have the energy he just would give up before he even started you know yeah. and just kind of have this yeah. idea yeah. of like no that's too hard mom yeah. i can't write that much that's too hard for me and now he's like bring it on you know <laughs> like what else do you want me to write so and then that starts to build on itself and create, create a, you know a different sense of self so it's been so exciting as a parent to see this shift in him. And, um, and I really want that for other families and it's available to them. And so I'm just so thrilled and so appreciative to you to taking the time um, to, to put this out there and to, to give families this information um, so they can have access to some of these things that can be really helpful. Oh, th thank you. Thank you for the work that you're doing. And, you know, for me, this is part of my life's mission. Um, I, I, I really, really want to help families around the world know that this is possible and mm -hmm. know that this isn't just an imaginary conversation. This is we're taking, you know, the, the, the science that's literally coming out as cutting edge and right. translating it into medicine. And it, it's basic biochemistry. And that, that's the cool part. We're taking science that's chemistry and biochemistry and using that to help kids' lives change. Yeah. And th that's, that's the most amazing part, that we have yeah. the opportunity to allow this kind of transformation to happen for ch all kids. Right, um, right. And that's, that's really why I made, made Holistic Minds. And that's the purpose behind all of this, to take kids who are suffering in pain, not feeling well, and allow them to become their best, brightest, mm -hmm. happiest versions of self that they can be. Right, right. And that's a great place to end that mm -hmm. everyone watching um, can go to holisticminds.com and it's um, holistic w h o l um, and there is so much great information up on the site already there's a, a very helpful quiz that families can take and um, in taking the quiz and it takes less than five minutes to do it um, you it, it gives you an idea of whether or not your child does possibly have some energy metabolism issues amongst um, a few other um, kind of core underlying um, common causes of, of things like sensory processing issues. Um, and that's something that a parent can literally type in right now on their computer and take five minutes and get some <clears throat> very helpful information. And um, I know on the site as well, there's a forum and a library with tons of resources and there's also more to come. So this is just exciting. the beginning. This yes. is just the beginning. I'm very, very excited to see all of the other things that we'll be rolling out in just the next few months. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't mm -hmm. wait. And so for anyone listening, go right now and sign up for Dr. K's newsletter on Holistic Minds um, so you can be updated on all, all the things that are going to be coming out as well. And mm -hmm. then you can have access to everything that's on the site right now. Thank you. So. Okay. Thanks, Dr. K. You're the best. And, and I can't wait to, uh, you know, to continue our conversations. Looking forward to it. Okay, great.